the wind whipped across the prairie at sunrise. Nearly 50 native kids did their best to listen to the shushes from their elders. But keeping quiet on a day like this is almost impossible. My full name is Christopher Aaron White Eagle. My tribal affiliation is uh, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. I come from Minnie Chris was born and raised in Rapid City, South Dakota. For Chris, Rapid will always be home, even if the city remains a place of dissonance and discrimination. This past winter, Chris ran a shelter for the unhoused, keeping his community warm through sub-zero nights. Chris and his wife helped to open and staff a youth center too. There are times in life, and often I found in Indian country, when you meet people who do so much for their families and their communities, you wonder how it's all possible. Chris is one of those people. He's also a butcher. Right now, I'm currently working at Wild Idea Buffalo Company. I'm the plant manager. I've been working there for 11 years. So what got me into the field of being a butcher, that was my dad's profession. Yeah, so I be, wanted to be like my dad. I was like, hey, my dad runs the kill floor, you know what I mean? I could do this. I didn't even wait till I was 18. I started dragging hides and guts and doing all that stuff whenever I was like 17 years old. Wild Idea is a meat wholesaler specializing in bison. To the Lakota people, you know, we believed the bison was a gift from the Great Spirit. We looked to the, the buffalo for strength. You're out in the prairie and you see a buffalo, a big storm's coming in. The buffalo will face the storm and he's taking it on head on. Years earlier, Chris's father had worked to restore and sustain traditional Lakota culture in Rapid, especially the local dance and drumming scene. Chris realized that Wild Idea was a similar opportunity. The way his company cared for the bison, the bond he was able to share with the animal, a bond his people had once all shared, this was now a rarity in Rapid's native community. So he came up with an idea. It was like, uh, hey, what do you guys do with all your old, old buffalo? You know what I mean? The ones that don't make our specs because we have like a certain um, standard that comes in the door. It's just like, well, we give them back to the land. You know, we just, we keep them until they die off. So then I said, well, you know what? You know, he should let me come and bring these kids out and do a traditional buffalo hunt. Then he wouldn't have to give it back to the land. He could give it to these kids so they could eat. And it'll help feed our center through the winter because then we can make stews and soups and all this stuff, you know? The reason why we needed to do, the, do it with the youth, you know, this buffalo hunt, right? We needed to show them to be fearless. We needed to show them the strength. A lot of our kids don't even have buffalo. You know, you ask them, they're like, oh, buffalo, you know what I mean? They don't want to eat it. You know, they don't know what it is. For Native people growing up in urban or suburban environments, it has been difficult, sometimes illegal, to maintain our language and culture from before European colonization. Many communities are left feeling in between. We're still tribal citizens, still proudly indigenous, but our spiritual and emotional pillars have been targeted and eroded by demands for assimilation. Chris told me once that we don't fit in within the white world because we're native, yet we can't fit in on the res because we're what you'd call McDonald's Indians. A hunt wouldn't solve everything, but it might help. Chris wrangled permission slips for what ended up being a group of 46 kids and found 18 adult volunteers to show for the group out to the bison herd. The night before the hunt, Chris and the crew held a sleepover at a local church. We get up at 4.30 and we had to be to the ranch by 5.30 before the sun came up. We had, I wanna say from 11 and 12 to, I think our oldest was 17 at the time. All the girls all was covered up in their blankets. They were still wearing their blankets. All the boys were like ready to go. They were running around and here I'm trying to yell at them and they were supposed to be quiet. I'm like, shh. We want to circle up and we want to sing a round of prayer songs before we get this started. Pastor John says his prayer 
and then uh, we, we pick up our first prayer song, you know. You know, everything we do as Native people, every, there's a song for everything. You know, just kind of gave you that energy, you know, that kind of set the tone, like, you know, I'm up. And then uh, they sent Smudge around. And um, it was a emotional, a kind of like a spiritual, emotional time. From there, it went to, okay, this is how it's going to go down. So me and the kids crept around the pole barn and kind of like getting down and just, I was like, shh, we got to be quiet. We got to be quiet. So here I am with, you know, all these these 46 kids trying to just be quiet, walking down and then kids being kids, they picked up every bone and everything on the ground. And it was just, I was like, guys, gotta be quiet, gotta be quiet. Literally, if we would if we would have been coughing or if we would have been loud, we would have scared the herd off. A bull stepped forward out of the herd and sang its song. It stepped back into the herd and came out once more, louder this time. Once more, it retreated back into the herd. Finally, on the third time, the bull came out of the herd, song in its throat. The hunters took him. They shot him and all the kids started screaming and war hooping and stuff and, look it, you know what I mean? Started screaming, it's down. And then they brought him back. My wife and all the ladies, they turned around and, uh, wiped it down with sage. And my wife and my daughters and all the girls, right? It was just them when they smudged down that animal, you know? And uh, just the words that was being said about that this brother from the Buffalo Nation, you know what I mean, gave our life so we could have food. We then went ahead and uh, pulled the heart. Those boys all took a bite of the heart. <laughs> Well, at first they wasn't going to, and then we had one older boy that was like, let me see it. And then he grabbed it and he like bit it, and he, you know what I mean? So then like, oh, well, he did it. You know what I mean? You know? And then um, from there, we just started skinning it. There was a bunch of older women that came and they wanted the heart and they wanted the liver. They wanted the kidney. They wanted medicine because they were going through some uh, medical issues. When we got done, there was like a, just a skeleton. All the meat was off. It looked like a piranha came through and just ate all the meat. And the only thing that was there was bone. <laughs> we ended up harvesting. I, I didn't have a scale or nothing, but I want to say it was at least, it had to be at least 450 pounds. I ended up cutting everything into roasts. And whenever we thawed them out, we just slow cooked them. And then I, I sliced them up and that's how we made our soup. So I, I, I was planning on not making no steaks or nothing like that. This is going to feed a lot of people. So if you're going to feed a lot of people, you go with soup. You know what I mean? You know, especially with our numbers we have up here, it's like, okay, we want to feed 100 people. We're on a budget. We're having soup. <laughs> Chris told me that for many of the kids in attendance that day, this was the first time they had ever enjoyed the taste of bison. There's a heaviness still to these kinds of first. They represent what has been taken. Like the hunt, the soup, hopefully, was the beginning of a relationship renewed. One that could last through whatever rapid South Dakota or America still has in store. If there was one feeling the kids expressed that day that still clings to Chris's heart, it's hope. Only thing the kids said is they'd love to do it again. And the fact that they like eating buffalo now, you know? <laughs> yeah, whenever we have buffalo soup and fry bread, they, they're all game for it, you know? All right, you know what I mean? It's, it's good, it's good. The soup, the hunt, the youth center, the shelter, all of it cannot be viewed in a vacuum. These are connected acts of reclamation, of moving beyond mourning what was lost and being angry at what's been stolen and beginning to celebrate the renewal of relationships once severed. Here we are in a world that they took everything from us. They took our language, they took our hair. My father was the last one in the boarding schools. It's been tough uh, just being a, a Lakota native man and trying to help my people. It's really been tough trying to work through all the traumas and all the stuff, the challenges we uh, go through on a daily. I think it's crucial for us 
you know, to try to get back some of the stuff and some of the ways, some of the ways of life that we have lost to try to help heal us, you know, as a whole community, as, you know, Native people. It's one thing to teach the kids about their culture and history. It's quite another to place them in the center of it all, to let them feel the grass of the prairie underneath their feet, to savor the taste of bison once again, to know through your community that urban spaces are still native spaces, now and forever.